which was one of the most professional people I've ever worked with. Is professional is sort of bandied about a bit, but it said that an amateur is someone who practices until he, he gets it right, and a professional practices until he cannot get it wrong. And Joan did. She would rehearse with us all, she would run lines, she did her homework, she was wonderful. One of the people I really loved on the show is Joan Bennett. When I first started on the show, on that very first day, I remember going up to her in the rehearsal room and introducing myself, and she was wearing a bracelet, and it had all of these little uh, charms on it, and she pointed them out. She had four daughters, and all of the charms had to do with, with her daughters. And that's a clue to the woman, because she, she was so motherly to all of us. And I knew her until the day she died. We became such close friends. We often had dinner together. I would go to her house in, uh, in uh, Scarsdale, and I would love the stories. I remember one night at 2 o'clock in the morning, Joan was showing me footage of her, her um, screen test for Scarlett O'Hara for Gone with the Wind. And we would just sit there and tell wonderful stories. And, and she became such a close friend. And when she died, she left me the most beautiful ball gown um, from one of her early films. And, and it's just a treasure. But I love the woman. I just I treasured every moment I worked with her. Joan Bennett has left me with nothing but wonderful memories. I just wish that she could be with us now to tell us her impressions of the show. But my impressions of her are only good. Uh, I remember the first day of rehearsal, I was kind of excited about working with a star like Joan Bennett because in her time she had been a really big star. But she was so down to earth. She was so unstar-like in her behavior toward us. She was so real that uh, it, we quickly lost any feeling we had about being self-conscious. She was a very generous person. She would offer to run lines with any member of the cast. Now that is very rare. Most actors are so concerned about their own parts that they have got time to worry about other people. But she did. I would come in in the morning and there'd be nothing but fluorescent lights on. Rehearsal lights are merciless. She would look beautiful. She had no makeup on. All the actors and actresses came in with no makeup on because they knew they'd be made up. She just looked beautiful. She looked beautiful in just her natural skin and her natural eyes. And also, she was generous with herself as a, a working person. I came in, say, and the production assistant had to set up chairs for rehearsal. She'd start helping us. She would start, I said, Joan, you'd make a wonderful production assistant. She was just great. She was nothing but generous. Miss Bennett. Yes. Um, well, I mean, you know, I was starstruck because um, uh, Miss Bennett and her sister, Constance, I knew a lot about and had, you know, seen movies and my mom had told me things. And I thought she was great. She had a, um, I thought she did a great job, too. She was very teeny. Um, and, I, you know, she was a very small, teeny little woman, but she commanded a a, she had a lot of presence, and um, and I remember that she came in in the morning with one of those neck things on, and I thought, oh my God, how in the world can you take that thing off and work? Doesn't that hurt? I never asked her, but I bet it hurt. <laughs> but she was great. Joan Bennett was my buddy. She was great. She was going with a fellow, David Wayne, I believe his name was. David Wild. Wild. She you know more about it than I do. Uh, David Wilde, and uh, she invited me to play um, bridge at her beautiful apartment every Friday night. She had an apartment of 72nd and Lex, gorgeous place. And so I got to know her that way. And she'd tell me a lot of Hollywood stories, that big thick lipstick of hers, you know. God, I'd see it on the glass when she put it down. She's a nice lady. Uh, Joan Bennett, uh, just... Uh Working with somebody of that stature and just coming into the studio and, and having scenes to work with her and stuff of that sort, and, and it was just the height of professionalism. And you never really got the, the impression that she was who she was, you know. She was uh, quite down to earth and really a, a quite a wonderful woman to, to work with and to know. You know, films of Hollywood's golden era featured many beautiful stars, but few as glamorous and talented as our next guest. Currently, she's going into her 
I think it's her fifth year as one of the stars of the vampire soap opera, Dark Shadows. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Miss Joan Bennett. <laughs> That's pretty. Thank you. Yeah. It's good for a hot day. You're a pretty lady. Thank you. Really you're sweet. Uh, you've done a movie. Another movie. Yes, Dark Shadows. A full-length feature? Yes, indeed. What was it like getting back? Well, it was quite different because the whole technique, I've made a film in about 10 years, and uh, we did it very quickly. We did it all on location in the old Jay Gould house in Tarrytown because it's gothic and spooky, uh -huh. the way this TV series is. And they had a camera that I've never seen before. It was a shoulder camera. Have you seen them? Yeah, well, they use those in television. They call them creepy peepees in television. No, no, they move all over. And I really? Said, what is Little that tiny thing on the whole movie camera doing here? Because I've never seen one before. I've never Were seen one Were they actually using it for? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. How many pictures is that total for you now? I think 73 or 4. Good night. 73 or 4. Do they haunt you? I mean, you keep seeing yourself on television? No, I never look. <laughs> Why? Why don't you look? Well, I only look, sometimes I look at my favorites. What, what are your favorites? Well, my favorites are uh, Little Women, Manhunt, Woman in the Window, and Scarlet Street. Woman in the Window is wild. Yeah, that, they show that quite a yes, lot. Yes, they do. I don't, you know, repeatedly look at Did you have, I'm curious, did you have any reservations about doing a film again? No, not at all. No. Well, I wonder how many Well, we were working, you know, it's like a repertory company, the whole company that worked on the... Well, it was like doing, doing yeah. your regular show. Right. Being with those people. That's right. And do they, on soap operas, we hear about, we used to do f f skits occasionally on soap operas where we'd hide lines under our neckties and, you know, do they do that? Do you hide lines around Heavens the set? Heavens no. And I think they engaged this whole cast because they were nearsighted because no one can see the teleprompter. And you have to, <laughs> you have to memorize it. That's a chore, isn't it? Yes, it, it is. is. You, ever, you know, I once visited a movie set and I was amazed. I know they're not doing it any longer because of uh, the money problems. Right. But years ago, I was in a movie set once, 20th Century Fox, and I saw them do 38 takes. I believe it. And I was there for literally hours, and they'd go, and, and every time the star would finish a the take, they'd walk over, and they'd pat the woman's yeah, face. Fix her hair. Fix her hair. Everybody said, it's Nothing one, like that. One hair, and they go, oh, one little scene, and it lasted. The scene was not more than a minute and a half. I know. I remember once in Little Women, George Cuco, who directed it, in a particular scene with me, we had 22 takes and he picked the second. I don't know how I should take that, but he gave up and said, well, never mind, we'll take two. But now it's just in. Well, that's what we did with Dark Shadows, but I didn't know whether that was because we were all working together for so long and it was a familiar story, or whether this was what they did because we rehearsed just a tiny bit and then take like two, three takes tops. Yeah, when you were doing those films, were you easy to get along with? I think so. What would you expect me to say? No. No, because <laughs> so many stars, you read so many wild things about stars being temperamental and this and that has to be right. What were you the most touchy about? Would you say your makeup or what? The hair. Really? Mm -hmm. Had to be just so. Mm -hmm. I did a western once. One of my, I think I did two. And this one was called, I forget what the name of it was, but anyway, I went through fire, flood, covered wagon, wars with the Indians, and each time I stepped out of the covered wagon, I was as neat as a pin. <laughs> <laughs> and I got so criticized for that that I wasn't as fussy after They that. wouldn't do that today, would they? No, no. Realism, no. How would you say that the young, the young leading men of today compare with the, the wonderful leading men that you co-starred with? Well, College. naturally, I'm prejudiced. Yeah. I could name, let's see just about every top leading man you can think of. Did you ever co-star with Clark Gable? No, I never did. How about, let's see, Gregory Peck, I know you Yes, did. I did. And uh, name some of the others. Oh, Ronald Coleman. Spencer uh, Tracy. Spencer Tracy. Oh. Cary Grant. Uh, oh, name it, I don't know, <laughs> an awful lot of them, but did five with Spencer Tracy. I heard it said once, now tell me if I'm wrong, I love to ask a star yeah. things like this. They tell me that women stars especially used to love to work with exceptionally tall mm -hmm. men because the chin line looks so great looking up. Is that true? Sure. <laughs> that would be, what, what would you do if you had a little tiny leading Oh, and I'll tell you what, Alan Ladd wasn't very tall. Yes, I know. And Loretta Young did a picture with him at Paramount. And to make him look taller, she walked in a gutter. You know, they... <laughs> 
I, you know, I thought I didn't think that was true, and I'm happy had to you find. Heard, had you I had that? heard the same stuff. I said, "Oh, that's one yeah, of those press agent things." She walked in the gutter. Yeah, well, <laughs> not literally. <laughs> <laughs> She'd look classy doing it, though. Yeah, she would. Would. We'll have more with Miss Joan Bennett following this. We'll be right back. I have a clear memory in those early days of Joan Bennett opening the double doors to Collinwood and saying, "Welcome." to Hollywood. Now, it's possible that I invented this, but my memory of it is so clear that I can't believe that it didn't at least happen once during rehearsal. Louis Edmonds was uh, incredible. He was always on. He was, um, he was, you know, he really was something out of a drawing room comedy or Noel Coward or um, and the southern charm and elegance um, but it wasn't that there wasn't a real person behind that also um, I think he was he was a caring person he was uh, he was kind he was a very loyal person um, but I just the way he his training was so great that he could just flip into his character um, just like that and it was disconcerting um, because he, he could make a wisecrack from one and then leave you in hysterics and turn in, the red light would go on, he'd be R Roger. Um. Darling Louis Edmonds, and I've said this many times before, so he'll forgive me. Louis Edmonds is probably one of my favorite people in the whole world. But frequently, Alexandra, with whom I became very good friends as a result of the show, Alexandra and I had uh, scenes with Louis, and Louis just made us giggle. And we, we would frequently have to almost turn our backs to the camera to stop, just to stop laughing. He was so wonderful, so grand, and so thoroughly charming. Louis Edmonds was another, Louis was one of those guys who was a Mr. Off-Broadway. I brought him in every serious actor in New York. New Louis Edmonds, because if, if you wanted a, a distinguished Englishman, you got Louis. Uh, he was just not the sort of guy that you would expect to be called Louis. Um, he, uh, and he came into this and saw what it wasn't. He and, and John Bennett made a great team because they both had a certain elegance about them. I remember Louis Edmonds. Um, my main memory is trying to cry over his bedside. He was dying, and I was playing his son. And I kept thinking, and my agent was going to be watching that day, Bob Lamont. And I, I kept trying to push out these tears. And instead of acting, I thought, well, just look at Louis and look at his face and see what happens. So we made eye contact. And because the guy just, I don't know, it was beautiful. He moved me. It was great. And I miss him. Great actor. I loved Louis. Sorry he passed on so early. Louis brought the touch of class of Newport when we were in Newport, Rhode Island. Newport, Rhode Island to the show. I was at that kind of above the, the fray. He spoke better than everyone else and you kind of listened to Louis. Some of us laughed behind the flats, but he was good. Dear Louis, another gentleman. Another gentleman. Although he would get quite uh, proper about certain things, you know, uh, where he might say something right out and Jonathan may stew about it, you know, uh, but Louis would, uh, and Louis was always going to his house on Long Island at that time, and I was, I couldn't imagine, he's got a house on Long Island, and he loved a garden, and uh, he just seemed, again, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the personality. And I think that that was one of the things that the writers and Dan were able to capitalize on. They were able to take those distinct personalities. And we had some, besides wonderful talent, we had wonderful personalities. I mean, on that show. They were distinct personalities. And they, ha they had talent to back that up. And Louis's personality, they just put it right into that character. His, his, his gentleman quality, his properness, his correct way of whatever, his, the way he held his body, his whole demeanor. 
it's uh, kind of a long time since Dark Shadows, and I can't remember the feeling except mostly of pleasure, but it was a whole different uh, ball game, I hate to say that word, uh, bec because of the later on in the costumes and, and the atmosphere, the atmosphere of, of, the, of the story is the thing that I think affects the feeling that we have more than anything else. And indeed, we were gothic, and the rain was... It, the sun never shone in Collinsport. It was always raining, and the lightning, the thunder was cracking out there. That would affect, I think, one's feelings, some, as it would in real life. And the, the feeling you have uh, so many years later, and all my children, is quite different. Uh, the company is different, which I suppose accounts for the main thing. It's a contemporary thing. Acting is, is a challenge period from day to day. It, it has, it, 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 for me, I was trained as a, as a costume actor, shall we say. It, my, my training at, at, at Carnegie Tech, now Carnegie Mellon, was in the Chekhov, the Shakespeare, the Shaw. So I was quite at home when we got to the period part of Dark Shadows. In fact, being a smarty, I thought I knew it all and was ahead of everybody. You know, I would even go over to somebody and say, you don't hold a fan that way, you hold it this way. And I was right, but um, because of the training we had had. But acting is a, uh, is a daily challenge, you know, it's just... I always li liken acting to tennis, I really do. I think that every time you serve, as the minute the ball leaves the, your racket and bounces over, and the challenge is on, you know, it's a minute-to-minute -minute thing, and the same thing in, in acting. It's a challenge <laughs> to live, really, minute-to-minute, -minute. because you never know what's going to happen, and you try to be in control of it not happening if it's not good. I like to tease, but only when it's not dangerous uh, for the other actor, or when, it's, when it doesn't hold things up, you know. I think it's fun to tease sometime, and you do that out of... Um, you're setting people up whom you love, really, is what it comes down to. I wouldn't give five minutes to, to someone who didn't interest me, you know, as a, as a performer. So it's always the people that you kind of like or who are on your wavelength. And uh, it's, not, it's not mischief. It's, um, it's a little private joke that, um, that you keep from the audience. And if you don't keep it from the audience, it has to, you have to stop and do it again. And I try not to go that far. It was kind of a first. Uh, it was sort of a daytime gothic series. It had uh, the most unusual thing about it, of course, was the introduction of a, of a, of a little vampire who, who, like the Hunchback of Notre Dame, was a loving character, you see. Um, he had the sympathy of the audience. He had the romantic pull with the young girls and uh, the, the horror. Well, I mean, every every high school students uh, fell out of the buses to get home in time to see the thing, you see. Um, it was a first, and I think that uh, uh, when you see it replayed, I, I saw it replayed once, I think, or twice when they did it the last time, and uh, it, it did seem like seeing kind of an early Hitchcock uh, to me. Maybe I fancied that, but there was something about that. The, the, there's a quality to the work, I think. Even, and even the dear mistakes of seeing a camera boom occasionally and seeing a great heavy door shake like a leaf when somebody's... Sent, it's, uh, even so, I think it, it, it had a little merit quite apart from uh, any other soap, surely. And I think it's natural that uh, and uh, the, the hard work of the organization of the young people who have kept it alive through these annual reunions and conventions and whatnot, uh, I think they've, they've done a wonderful job, and I think that too is partly responsible for, for the interest taken in it. Katie Scott told me about this the other day. Um, she put out this book, you know, and uh, very sweetly, and then uh, the pictures of us and stories of us, and I've looked at the pictures, but I haven't read the book. As a matter of fact, I loaned the book to one of the cameramen from Dark Shadows, who is now with us in All My Children, and he hasn't given it back to me. But at any rate, I remember that uh, in those days it was, it was expensive to stop the camera and start it up again, and I thought I was through. And I went upstairs to the dressing room and started taking off everything. And Bob Costello, the producer, came screaming up the stairs, you're back on, you're back on. 
I said, oh my God. <laughs> so, so it was too late to redress which is better than the story I remember. I remember pulling up my britches and running down those little narrow stairs saying, hold the tape, hold the tape. But what they did was, they, they, I don't think they stopped the tape, thereby saving $500 or something, and they got me in t to the mantelpiece and they just shot like this, you know, and I was probably naked as the day I was born below and I was shaking so from the nerves of it, you see, that I was holding this glass of wine <laughs> which Katie said was spilling all over the place. Now that's funny. <laughs>